So it's going to be fun. FT after the first domestic day of baseball games with Braun, Kratz, and AJ. Right, Kratz? You know how sometimes I'll say who's on the show right off the jump so that the podcast crowd later on can listen and they know who's there? They'll never it's, it's guess. Braun, Kratz, and AJ. Once this sultry voice jumps in here after I'm done talking, they'll, it's just, they're going to be like, what did AJ do? Is, did AJ have some whiskey last night? How, how did, why does he sound like that? <laughs> AJ Ramos, welcome to the party, man. How you doing? I think you're on mute. Do we have you? No way. No, oh, there you are. There you are. We got yeah. you. AJ, great to have you on, man. Thanks for jumping in here on a Friday. First time here on FT. How you doing? How's life? Life has been great. Uh, just adjusting to post playing. Uh, now just out there living life, having fun, uh, being a dad. Uh, it's been it's been great. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I've seen I've seen some of the stuff for the show. Uh, I love what you guys are doing, and I'm just happy to be a part of this. So, yeah. to introduce yourself to the crowd here, I'd like you to give your own bio. Like, if you ran into somebody in the supermarket and they were like, uh, you know, what did you do for your career? You're catching up with someone and they're like, you know, what was your career before this? What would you tell them for our, for our young crowd out there? Because it, it hasn't been too long, but people forget fast. You know how it is. You got to let them know what you were able to accomplish in the bigs. Yeah. I mean, it's the turnover now is, is crazy. Uh, so, but yeah, I would tell them uh, I'm a really tall guy you know, about six foot five, I'm just like, I'm five, <laughs> five, ten. Uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, but I was one of the best closers in the game at one point. Um, uh, I loved the pressure of it all. I performed the best when there was more pressure in the game. Um, I achieved more than what most people thought I would achieve. Um, and I did that with hard work, perse perseverance and, uh, yeah, so that's that's what I did. I got to play with some of the best in the game. I had uh, some of the best coaches. Um, I, you know, Barry Bonds was a, was one of the coaches of mine. I got to play with Ichiro, got to play with Shohei, Trout, Stanton. Play with some of the best that to, to ever play the game. So uh, that's kind of what I would tell them. And then just by name dropping them, those players, they're gonna be like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty cool. So I can name <laughs> drop a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's what I tell the young guys. And one of your and one of your best friends is is G. I mean, you guys were friends when it was, when you guys were, when he was Mike, like Mike from the block. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But don't, don't think you can come here and name drop because the other AJ name drops a lot. And I'm going to name drop and I'm going to treat you like a rookie here because I have a little audio. If you want to, we can talk over this, we can talk over this video if you want, but a little, just a little, you know, a little highlight film here if you want to. <laughs> Tell us. Wow. <laughs> Heads up in Club Goodwill. Heads Look up. Right there, right? Wait, what was the score? What was the score in this? Let me see. Seven to six. Was. Oh, man. So and Kratz, give the play by play. Going. Yeah, Just, for people that would be listening later, what happened? I wasn't even, the play by play there was about 427 to left center, 92 down and in. AJ thought he could, he could, he could sneak something by me, but what he didn't know is I had literally just gotten to Milwaukee. I wasn't even wearing my own cleats, not even wearing my own batting gloves. I had my own bat. Surprised they found a helmet that fit my huge noggin. And that that look right there that nobody on the podcast can even think of. AJ went to the he went to the pine tar and on his on his forearm. He's like, <laughs> I don't know if that guy's hitting a home run off me. I no, struck him out no, too no. many times before. No way he should have success against me. See, what happened there is I was throwing on a bum shoulder. My shoulder was already torn at that moment. So like I was throwing on a bum shoulder. You got lucky on that. I wasn't that was in the fifth inning. What what was I doing pitching in the fifth <laughs> inning? Like were, that's probably the big thing. Like, yeah. So if it was in the ninth, you wouldn't have got that wouldn't have happened. You got lucky, no, but I'll give you that. I'll, I'll give you that. I need I needed to take advantage. I mean, hey, if you if you were limping on the mat, I still would have tried to hit a dinger off you. I didn't I didn't get that many. You know, I'm not I'm not I wasn't the elite closer that you were, but when I heard you were coming on, I sent I sent this over to our producer and so we had a there's always a good laugh. Always a good laugh. I like Yeah, no, you got me. You got me. Yeah. <laughs> first homer for Kratz as a brewer. And also, uh before we get going, just wanted to kind of reminisce for one moment on an opening day moment for you, AJ, um, back in 2015. 
and we thought it was really cool. So just wanted to get your insight on what the Marlins did. And I don't remember seeing anything like that since, but I think that it should get copied. It's been long enough. It's been about a decade. So what happened? Yeah, when they told us that Michael Buffer was going to announce our game, we were like, this is cool. Like, this is going to be unique. And then they said, yeah, you're going to go up in the stands for this. We're like, what? We're going to be in the stands coming down? So that kind of rubbed us a little bit of the wrong way because we're like, what? how are we going to – like, most of us are in cleats. We're going to have to, like, you know, we might fall with all this and that. So, like, at the time, we were like, this is going to be too much. We just want to play the game. But now looking at it, it's really dope. I don't think I've seen anything like it um since then or before that so like looking back at it now it's a really cool experience to like be the man in arena in the arena that you know michael buffer is announcing in so like it's it's he's a legendary person so like being able to experience that was really really dope and i think you're right this something like this may need to happen more often because uh he's a legend man and and like that voice oh man talk about smooth that was that was really dope it got you pumped up to play I like it. That's cool. Yeah, one of those things where at the time you're like, yo, leave us alone. We want us to just play ball. And then now it's it's really cool to look back on. So let's charge the damn mound on opening day 2024. What we saw, what we liked, what we didn't like. Overreacting is really fun too. We're just gonna He's charging the mound. Yeah, we're just gonna charge the mound and end some seasons at some point. But first let's start with Texas and Chicago, because I guess we're gonna end the ump show season early here. Um the Rangers end up winning thanks to Jonah Heim with a walk-off, which was super fitting, Kratz, because if you were Jonah Heim a few innings earlier, you'd probably be pretty pissed off that you gave up a run on a foul tip that should have been a dead ball, and the ump doesn't want to admit fault. I don't know where Chad Fairchild could have gone in that situation. I mean, I don't even know if you can go and ask for help because the other umpires could have seen it. Had they seen it, they'd have thrown their arms up. But man, I, I mean, just the look of bewilderment from Heim in that moment, like it, it, it is a, it's a debilitating feeling. Like you don't know, like, golly, like you, how did you not see this? I saw this. You're the closest person. The hitter knew it. You could see the hitter's reaction. And now all of a sudden it puts them down. They almost lost the game because of it. But he came back. Obviously, he was the one that was going to get the game-winning knock. I mean, how else How else could you write that script differently? All right, so let's show the video and then get AJ's thoughts on the back end of it. And the ball get away, and here comes the runner. He's going to be safe. Did he think it was fouled? Heim is talking to the home plate umpire like it was a foul ball. Watch if the ball changes direction at all. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so it definitely, like, as you're the, when you're the catcher, you can hear it. You can see the, the ball moving, you know, the way it did. But at the same time, the play wasn't called off. So, like, it's like my dad always said, hey, be hurt after the play. You know, if you get hurt, you know, make sure you get hurt. At, make the play, then be hurt. It's the same thing, like. I know it's tough, and I know he he felt it, and he saw the ball skip off, and he because he had it right there, and then you know it changed directions, but you also still got to stay with it. Him and the pitcher, both guys, the call the call wasn't over, so you got to still keep playing the game, or else something like this happens. But he also came back and won the game, so it isn't too bit big of a of a mistake. Um, but yeah, that's that's something you got to continue to play until they they uh, blow the whistle, as they say. <laughs> no doubt, and he and. His frustration to be able to come back and get this big knock. Like, first of all, you said, Scotty, you were like, what would you do in this situation? A, they'd have pinch hit for me in that situation. So B, it would have been, it's it's debilitating, but exactly what AJ said. You got to play it through. It's only second and third, and they get out of that inning, and Jankowski ends up hitting a walk-off. If LeClerc fields his position and continues the play, and if Jonah doesn't, you know, oh no, B, you, ah, E, it that could have it could have really opened the floodgates, but it could have also been a tie game, and they would have walked it off in the ninth on Jankowski's like eighth home run of his career. Yeah, and you get to save the bullpen a little bit as well, um, you know, all those things too, because you know, like everyone else kept playing, with the exception of those the, the catcher and the pitcher, right? Everyone else was still playing the game. 
So like, you know, you got to, you got to continue to uh, uh, play it out and uh, until they, they blow it dead, basically. Yeah, and props to Michael Bush. Great base running. To just go for it. And he's trying to make some noise with the new club. He had no space on the roster with the Dodgers. And that was a big trade for them in the offseason. So he helps. But ultimately, the Cubs lose. And I also want to get to the Justin Steele injury in a sec. But to kind of put the bow on the ump situation, we did have Chad Fairchild talking post game. It's always so weird. They, they call it like the pool reporter. So one person gets to walk the plank and talk to the ump where I'm like, can't they just speak? Well, can't, can't we just have everybody go to the ump and get five minutes like you would for a player if there is a controversial situation? Like one person has to raise their hand and go or one person is assigned. I just think that's stupid and archaic. Anyway, we have the transcript, the back and forth. So the question, could you explain the ruling of the pass ball in the ninth? And Fairchild goes, yes, I ruled it a swinging strike. Oh, thanks, Bozo. And then here's the next question. Have you had a chance to watch a replay? I have. What are your thoughts after watching that? Well, I'm just going to stick with what I did on the field. If you've got questions for that, I'm not going to talk about videos. And then the question, that's not a reviewable play, correct? And then the answer, it is not a reviewable play. So in true baseball fashion, we are not going to refer to 2024 video that shows you are wrong. Kratz, quite simply, can he just say, hey, I watched the video after, screwed up, I'm a human, I'm going to do better everyone would be like, thank you. Like the, the egotistical answer here to a reporter is so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. I mean, we're looking at a printed out script, answer, question. And it's like, we serious? Like he is a human. To me, this would even elevate some of the umpires uh, relatability. And some umpires don't have much of a personality and Chad would be on, he would be on the lower end of the personality and that's fine. Like you don't have to be, you know, an umpire, like jazz Chisholm's a player. Like you just have to be who you are, but why can't, why can't he answer questions? What are they trying to avoid emotion? Like an umpire giving you emotion after a game, after a call, like, like the whole Jim Joyce thing, how pissed was all of Detroit when he missed that call for, for Galarraga's game. Super pissed. The next day when Jim Joyce comes out and he's crying when he's handing the lineup card and and uh, Galarraga's out there exchanging the lineup card, like that's the human aspect that everybody wants out of social media, out of all the stuff that we see entertainment-wise in sports. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, they have one of the hardest jobs. No, someone's going to be mad at whatever call that they make no matter what right <laughs> like they're the most unlike people on the field and it's fans both teams right so like they have to have this type of ego or this type of protection around them so that they can like uh, uh be able to function because it's 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 got to be a tough job i wouldn't want to be an umpire uh sure. to deal with all that pressure but at the same time like you said he's human and the, when they show that human emotion of saying, hey, I messed up, you know, uh, that was the wrong call at the moment. I thought I saw it this way. And you can understand that in that moment, like he it, he may not have even heard that he, he did. He can't see it. The, the, you know, the catcher's in the way. So, like, it's hard to make that call. It's a hard call to make but at the same time. Like if you if you do say that, hey, you know, like uh, I, I missed that call. Uh, it affected the game. Um, I'll try to be better next time, you know, and also too, why isn't that a reviewable play? Like, I feel like that's, that's a tough one to make. That's, that's a lot of pressure to put on that umpire. So like, why isn't that like a, a reviewable play? It doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Because it's a tough call. Like that's a tough call. If he comes down is like, dang, I missed that. Like it was loud. It might even open the discussion for that. Like you said, AJ, it might open the discussion. Hey, why can't we, why can't we review that? You know, it is a split second, you know, hair of the ball that he touched that everybody knew, the batter, and I don't know if LeClerc knew it or not, but Heim knew it. Like, why not? Just, hey, boom, this will take 30 seconds. We'll just get this right. Nobody's, in this situation, nobody's going to be pissed if the call goes against the Cubs, if the call goes how it's supposed to be. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we got to get this right. Like, that's totally fine. Nobody wants to be like, got away with that one. 
Like that's not, <laughs> that's not what you want. Yeah. Yeah. And make it reviewable because if it is inconclusive, then you just say, we can't make a decision. Can't but that tell. one was so easy and obvious. It's just stupid. It's 2024. Just get the freaking calls right enough already. I hate having to talk about this stuff all the time, but we will keep talking about it. It was a super entertaining game. We're going to get to the Dodgers Cardinals next and cover a bunch of other games from opening day, but just to kind of get to a few other notes from this game, Wyatt Langford debut, my dude, got intentionally walked mid at bat too later on in the game. Oh, you by were Mary's so happy, Scott. That's his, I'm like, that's don't his wanna, boo. I don't want to face he's the rook. Dude. That's yeah. his boo. Yeah. He's, he's so boo. It was a, it was a great game. Dude, it was entertaining. The, the Jankowski tying homer, you're in front of the crowd that won the World Series. You get the walk-off from Heim to kind of make up for the, quote, mistake, whatever. And then there was some some unfortunate news in this one. Justin Steele goes down with a hamstring injury on a bunt attempt and had to leave the game in the fifth inning. He was jumping off the mound to get a bunt from Leody Tavares. So that sucks. It sounds like he's going to miss some time and be placed on the injured list. He's the ace of the Chicago Cubs. I already didn't feel great about their starting staff. So yeah. that's concerning. The NL Central in general is concerning. So let's get to it right now. Katie Wu from The Athletic joining us right after opening day here. Katie, great to talk to you. Good to see you. And we'll stay on this NL Central. The St. Louis Cardinals get bopped by the Dodgers yesterday. Are Cardinals fans freaking out already? I think they were freaking out maybe when pitchers and catchers reported. And look, here's here's the thing, guys. One, it's great to see you. Um, but but two, look, opening day elicits a ton of overreactions, either positive, negative, and that makes sense, right? Because it's opening day. It's all this new optimism, promise of a new season. And I think Cardinals fans were so frustrated and upset about yesterday's loss because the way the Cardinals lost mirrored pretty much every game that they lost in 2023. So you come out there on opening day and you have, again, the optimism, the excitement of a new season, and you roll out basically a tribute video to last year was what last game, what yesterday's game felt like. So what would have been different? All the same things go a different way and they win the game? Cause you still are like, you're, you're putting a, you're putting a bandaid over a, over a damn leak. That's a great way to put it. I Look, this is not the Cardinals roster that they thought they were going to debut with. You know, Sonny Gray is out until the, or the first two weeks at least. Lars Newbar, Tommy Edmond, and Dylan Carlson, who was supposed to be the reserve outfielder, he's hurt too. So they're playing definitely not with their A squad. But yesterday, I mean, you go out there and Miles Michaelis goes out, throws 29 pitches in the first inning, already is in a hole. Cardinals offense goes completely flat with the exception of Paul Goldschmidt. And the way the Dodgers kept attacking and adjusting off Michaelis, the, you know, Betts, Freeman hit the home runs off him in the third inning. And then there's virtually no response offensively. It just felt like last season again. And I don't want to jump onto the, you know, this is the same season as last year trend. It's one game, you guys. But I think the fans' frustration, again, stems from this one game showing a lot of similarities to last season's roster. But again, one out of 162. Surely not a feasible sample size, but I do understand fans' frustration with the product of the game yesterday. And one more on this game were the comments from Miles Michaelis about the Dodgers playing checkbook baseball. And I love Miles. I'm sure you do too to cover him because he's so candid. He's so great with the media. Um, been a big fan of him as a person for a long time. And obviously he's facing a tough team. And he said he was hearing it from the fans, checkbook baseball. Uh, so what did you think of the line and then the reaction from Miles? Because even post game, he just was like, all right, cool. They gave it to me. So I like that stuff. We need more of that. I'm always promoting that. No, I agree. Talk your shit. I think it makes it much more fun. But yeah, you know, Miles went out there and they did boo him on opening day. They showed him warming up on the scoreboard and he responded by tipping his cap and acknowledgement to the crowd. So, you know, it's all fun and games for Miles. That's what I like about him is he's not afraid to say what he thinks or feels and he'll answer whether he's on the right side or the wrong side at the end of the, the outing. I think for Miles, you just saw sometimes Miles Michaelis can get almost penalized because he's so accurate in the zone. This dude throws a ton of strikes and, uh, Guys like Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman, Will Smith, they they will hit those pitches. So I think he executed. He did throw 18 out of 20 first pitch strikes. It wasn't like he was erratic or didn't have command. It's just that's a really, really good lineup. And when, you're, when your name to the game is weak contact, you know, you're going to get burned by that sometimes. And he did in the first inning that Cardinals had the infield in, Mookie Betts on third, one out. 
And a slow rolling ground ball off the bat of Freddie Freeman leads to a run. Dodgers end up scoring two that inning. And that's just kind of how it snowballs from there sometimes. Yeah, uh, on on Michaelis, yeah, like he, he does get penalized for being in the zone too much sometimes. I think it doesn't put enough fear in the hitters. You know, sometimes you got to brush them off. You got to show a little bit of erratic stuff uh, to kind of get them uncomfortable. Because when they're comfortable, when they know you're going to be in the zone, they know they just got to pick the right zone, basically, uh, to uh, – uh, zone in on to to make it more accurate to the hit or whatever to make makes them a little bit more hitter uh, hittable, but uh, yeah, what do you got on their pitching staff? Like, how do they follow up after Michaelis, and how do they, um, you know, what do they got working with? So they'll throw Zach Thompson today against Bobby Miller. Thompson was projected to be the sixth starter. He's a young lefty. Was a first rounder for them, uh, and. With Zach, I think you're seeing this is his like make it or break it year in terms of if he can be a starter. And he had a hell of a spring. He was excellent, definitely deserves this opportunity. Behind the Cardinals or behind Thompson, they'll go Lance Lynn on Saturday, uh, Stephen Matz on Sunday, and then Kyle Gibson to take on the Padres and Mike Schiltz on Monday. And the reason they did this was was purely matchup. Obviously, with Gray out, Miles is going to get opening day. They wanted Lance Lynn to get the home opener, which is April 4th. So then they kind of stacked from there. Steven Matz had a slow spring on purpose. It was intentional. They uh, w- thought that maybe by having a slow progression over the spring, they could get his durability up because Matz does have a pretty extensive injury history in his tenure here in St. Louis. Um, and that essentially left a spot for either Thompson or Gibson, number two. And given how uh, lefty heavy the Dodgers lineup is, Ollie Marmel went for the matches there and put Thompson. So it's not a rotation that's necessarily going to strike fear in a lineup like the Dodgers, but I'm really excited to see what Thompson can do because uh, I thought he was really close to breaking out last year and he had a really good spring. So, What was the vibe like there? I mean, it was kind of a historic day to be at Dodger Stadium. You have Shohei's domestic debut and this team did so much in the off season. Dodger fans are just at peak happiness right now. And it's the regular season, so they're probably going to cruise to 100 wins. Did you feel like it was a party there? I felt honestly overwhelmed because there was just <laughs> so much going on. And it didn't really hit me that it was opening day until the scoreboard video started and the fans started going crazy. But it was just, it felt like a playoff game almost, or maybe because I think there was just so many people there, so many media, and it was, you know, it's in LA, so it's it's a star-studded event. But once the actual opening day festivities started, I was like, okay, there is a baseball game here today, so we should probably lock it in. Um, incredible environment, though. You know, I like just opening the season at home, but if there was one place that I would choose to be for this year, it'd be LA, so it worked out really well. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was really fun, and Dodgers fans, you know, I went in, into the crowd, and we're talking to to fans about Otani and everything that's going on with that situation. And they were not deterred at all. It was like full throttle, super excited. This is a billion dollar baseball team, so you should be excited about it. Um, I think that if I, again, if I could pick anywhere to have opened the season, it would have been LA, even if it was a crazy intense, hectic day. If this series continues to go the direction that it's going, as you said, oh no, 2023, 2.0, is, the opening day for the Cardinals going to not quite have the same luster after they signed three new pitchers and like, hey, you know what? Brush it off. Brush your shoulders off. But if they lose three out of four to the Dodgers, what kind of reception do you think the team is going to get? Because Cardinals fans are nice, but nice is only because they constantly are in the playoffs and they're constantly a World mm-hmm. Series contender. What kind of nice are they going to see when they get home? Um, well, that's a really good question. So they'll, they have three more games here in LA. They'll go to San Diego against their former manager, Mike Schild after this, that dude's going to manage the game. Like or those three games, like it's the world series. Um, <laughs> so they have a pretty, pretty brutal start in terms of needing to win those, those games. And then they get to, to St. Louis for the Marlins an old bench coach and an already manager of the year, Skip Schumacher. So a lot of emotional ties that I think would maybe further that angst, but I, the, the fans that show up to Bush Stadium every day are very, very nice. They're good fans. You know, they're very engaged with the game. They're very insightful. But I think it's a good point and a good question to ask is how will they receive the team if this team gets off to a bad start? I mean, already the frustration is evident and fans are going to be fans. And I guess, you know, the online portion doesn't represent the entire fan base. I still think it'll be festivities because it's St. Louis. It's a baseball town. It's opening days basically like 
second Christmas around there. Um, but yeah, I think this is a fan base that wants to be optimistic, but it won't take much for them to turn. So I think it'll be important for the Cardinals to find a way to win at least half these games out here and then try to just play a 500 April. They have a really brutal first month and then we can see how the season plays out from there. Yeah, I think what'll help them too is it's a mid division. You know, I, I think yeah. we knew going into the season it wasn't going to be great, but with the Reds injuries and now the Cubs losing steel, I think the division might just keep them involved for a while. So hopefully that helps for Cardinals fans. I wanted to ask you about the manager situation because we haven't had you on since. So you mentioned Schilt. I agree. He's going to be like, we're sweeping this team. There was yeah. a lot of beef between him and the org. So comparing that to the current situation where I would say Ali Marmo's Q rating among fans is not as high as Mike Schilt, and yet he gets an extension. So what was your take on how that all went down and, and how fans are feeling about it? Yeah, so I was uh, pretty surprised when I, I caught wind of this extension coming, and I talked to John Mozeliak, their president of baseball ops, a couple of days after, and he said, yeah, you know, Ollie basically had no idea it was coming. I surprised him. And then I talked to Ollie, and he said, that is a true statement. So the timing of the extension from a fan standpoint, I think, was a little crazy. But after talking to the people in the org, it does make sense. Ollie was in the final year of his contract. I don't think Bill DeWitt jr the ownership group and mo had any like inclination to make a managerial change so why let ollie walk into 2024 as a lame duck manager because then you know if this april snowballs into an april like that mirrors last year for example then ollie's employment status becomes a distraction for this team so the philosophy was let's just lock him up for the next three years he's not going to go anywhere anywhere or any we want him to stay. He's not going anywhere. So why don't we just make this official before the season starts? Now, what the front office did, whether they realized it or not, was they've left nobody to blame but themselves now in this situation if this Cardinals team you know, is not competitive. So by by locking up Ollie, I think he, they did the right thing because he does have the backings of that clubhouse. He does. Ha he is respected by his coaching staff. It's just now, you know, if this team spirals, and again, it's been one game, but if this team spirals, then it's it's Mo who's answering the questions at this time. And to be fair, he's the one who did build this roster. Katie, I got a couple questions about Victor Scott. One, how many bags do you think he's going to steal? And also, do you think he will hit? Okay. Oh, man. I, this dude, I, I feel like he's anytime he gets on base, he's got he's got the green light. So he stole, he stole 94 last year, I believe. When was the last time baseball had 100 steals in a season? That would be, if I could pick a nice round number, I'd pick that one. <laughs> this dude, he's, wow. he impacts the game just by getting on base. I mean, you know, Cardinals didn't have a lot of action, but he definitely made Mookie Betts brush his throw for an error to get on base. And then, you know, Glass now knows he's stealing, so he's pulling everything, uh, coming across his body, bounce a change up, because you know that Scott's going to run. So maybe, maybe that can be my bold prediction. I'm not very good at hot takes, so maybe I'll do that one. Um, but yeah, I think I think the bat's going to be the biggest question. But that's always kind of the biggest questions with these defense first guys. I remember having the same conversation about Mason Wynn when he first came up, and he did struggle. You're you're supposed to struggle when you get to the big leagues. Um, there's there's a big learning curve that even the most talented guys, you know, have trouble adjusting to. Baseball is a game of adjustments. So the the good news is if Victor does struggle, and I don't anticipate him doing so, but if he does. Lars Newbar is going to be back in a couple of weeks. Tommy Edmonds on the bend. He doesn't have to like fight for this organization to stay afloat like a lot of the guys did last year. If he does struggle, he can go back to AAA, adjust there. Because remember, he skipped AAA entirely, and then he can come back. But I do think the Cardinals figure that he'll be a dynamic player for them. So it's just a matter if he can hit for contact or find a way to get on base, and then the rest will take care of itself. Because that defense and that that speed, that's legit. Katie, you've been on here. I think four times now you've been on our show. You're one of our one of my favorite guests to have on because you bring the Cardinals real, but you got to bring it real. We need a number. This is Bet MGM show here about baseball. We need <laughs> Victor Scott's number. You can't just throw a hundred out there and, yes, and make can. me start looking at odds. I need to hear a number. What's the number so I can choose? I don't know. I don't know. No, oh, I don't know. That we don't. This isn't Todd, Todd Frazier's not on right now. We don't play both sides of the fence. <laughs> You're right, you're right, you're right. Um, I'll do 75. Wow. 75. But even that, think about that. that. I mean, Acuna led last year, I think, in the, what do you have, 71 or two, something like that, right? Low 70s. Yeah. So if, if that's day. the case, and he played every day, if, if that's the case, this season, Victor Scott would probably lead 
the league in stolen bags. It's pretty impressive. Well, he's got one heard already. It, heard, so. He does. Heard it here first. Katie Wu. Hey, I'm, I'm all about it. I, I, I agree, Woo-hoo. Katie. If he stays up on the big league roster, I think he's stealing 70 plus. So I'm with you. Just say it, Scott. Um, which is it? 70 or 75? You got to take the over under. And don't just take the on easy 70, under. What? Over under on 75 for Victor Scott? Katie said it. Here's, 74 and a half. Here's the reason why I'll I'll go under that number this year. I do think, Katie, that he could go through a slump and they could either demote him or sit him a little bit because there's depth and there's guys coming back. I think that's the only thing that could hold him back. If he's playing, he's stealing 75 bags if he's playing every day. But that's that's where I'll take the under just because I'm not sure if he's totally ready yet. He didn't really – did he play at all in AAA? He, he was no. only a double-A guy, right? Yeah. So uh, hit tool's good. It's not great. So that would be where I'll put the the risk against him playing the whole season as a starter. Yeah, well, keep in mind, guys, I did project the Cardinals to win. Uh, I took the over on 94 wins last year. So <laughs> you and AJ, not Ramos, AJ Przinsky. Przinsky, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I really well, thought they were going to be good. My bad. I don't think I don't think anyone saw <laughs> that bad. coming. The, the 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 nightmare that it turned into. But Katie, great catching up with you. Enjoy uh, game two in LA, and we'll catch you soon. You got it, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katie Wu from the Athletic, joining us. We'll post obviously her Twitter account on ours, so you can see more of her work. Give her a follow and check out all of her articles as well. Hot corner time. Let's sizzle. Okay, let's keep running through opening day. I would like to select the Yankees-Astros game next. It's one I focused on for a little bit of time. Juan Soto making his debut with the Yankees. Was so Juan Soto, Kratz. I mean, he gets the RBI knock. He, of course, has two walks. And then the, I don't want to say the un-Juan Soto-like thing, but the surprising part was him saving the day for the New York Yankees in the bottom of the ninth inning to preserve a 5-4 win. He had... The throw home, that was so money. We're going to watch it here right now. There's the knock to right. And here's the beautiful Chuck on one hop. They get the out at home. It keeps a 5-4 lead. They end up winning, getting the extra out. The Astros challenge it. I mean, it's late in the game, so they're going to challenge it. They challenged the tag and the block. But, I mean, former Yank, you know how it is. This team was going through it last year. They're really happy after day one. Absolutely. Is this is this a good day from Juan Soto? Like, are Yankees fans going to be okay with two walks and an RBI? Because this is what he does every single day, and he just delivered. He delivered a nice throw to the plate. Let's relax, okay? You know, this is Jose Trevino's game right there. Like, he's just trying to get another platinum glove. If he stays healthy, that was a beautiful tag. I would have liked to see him not maybe chase the body as much and go for the hand back of the plate there, but. It looked like they could overturn it, but they said call stands. They didn't say call was confirmed. So maybe New York was kind of a little hesitant on whether or not they actually tagged him. Dubon didn't think they tagged him, but I don't know. If if they would have called obstruction on that play, it would have been already, already for my over six ejections for Aaron Boone started opening day. He would have lost his absolute mind. Man, I think that's just you being the catcher in you, like yeah, well, yep. devaluing yep. that throw right there because yep. that's in a big spot in the game, you know, and he was able to keep his emotions in check and I throw a pretty good strike. And now it's not perfect, but like for, you know, Juan Soto, that's an amazing throw, man. It's in a big spot in the game on the run, man, that's, you can't, you can't do that much better than that. Really. Perfect. Uh, yeah, perfect. It, was a, it was a great throw and in, in his debut game. So yeah, that was that was a big moment there, and he came up and showed why they signed him, not just for the bat, not just for all the walks he's about to get and make tire out pitchers, you know. Uh, so he, he's he just showing what he's got out there, man. He's he's a great player. That yeah, what you said, mm-hmm. AJ. What you said, AJ. Not not to interrupt you, Scott, but no, you about didn't. tiring out the pitchers. Oh my gosh, him and Anthony Volpe, our guy Derek is loving it behind the scenes right now. Like to see 50 pitches from two guys in a game, that's ridiculous. That is when everybody says, oh, this team is so old. Even you said it earlier this week, Scott, this team is old. They've gotten old fast. 
They have. But when you have veterans, if you can have line, if you can have at bats like that throughout the lineup, it will give so much more value when this team goes through the struggles of striking out and you know oh they just look lackluster you put together good at bats like those two guys did seeing over 50 pitches in a game that is ridiculous and that's to me that's the value that soto changes the lineup yes he's gonna have 30 plus he's gonna have 100 plus he's gonna score 120 runs all that stuff he's gonna have 400 on base percentage but those pitches seen is huge 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 going forward and Derek, and I, I recaps Derek, who had a great show last night, uh, pointed out that Volpe also saw a ton of pitches and had three walks. Yeah, just get on base for him with that speed, too. Um, I know he went through some ups and downs last year. So here, I'll, I'll drop an overreaction city on both of you. Should we be concerned about the Astros getting to the back end of their bullpen? Framber Valdez is one of the keys to the season for Houston. He was so up and down last year and was not good in the playoffs. 41 balls, 45 strikes, and four and two thirds. A lot of free passes from him. Seth Martinez comes in, who actually was great for them last year. 17 for 17 stranding runners. And of course, first <laughs> runner that he uh, <laughs> deals with that's on base scores. That's baseball for you. But I was worried about Framber. I mean, dude's got to throw strikes. If he's around the zone, his stuff's nasty. You're going to get ground balls and Ks. But guys are waiting him out. And that was a thing last year too, Kratz. It was. It was. And if you don't, I mean, this is this is AJ's this is AJ's area of expertise, getting to that back end elite part of the bullpen. But if you're if your starters don't go a hey, overreaction city, absolutely. But you're overreacting because of the trend that you saw last year. Yes, we saw for Amber's no hitter, but we also saw walk central. He's getting five punches and five walks. He's not doing his team a service. He's also not doing himself a service because that curveball doesn't need to be out of the zone. That sinker doesn't need to be out of the zone. He has elite enough pitches, and I think that sinker is becoming a little flat from last year and yesterday, and that completely eliminates anybody needing to swing at it unless it's up. Before, he had more sink, so you had to see it up, and he was still getting ground balls. But he's the key. I mean, who if he's not the key to this rotation, who is? And that and that is that pretty much answers your question. If you can't come up with somebody else, that's the key. Because right now, without Verlander, he's the key. Yeah, it's tough, man. His stuff is so nasty. But sometimes when you're that nasty, it's hard to control that. You know what I mean? <laughs> the part part of what makes him good too is his like what I talked about with uh, with Michaelis is that he's so in the zone, so it makes it easier to hit him sometimes. You know. But with, with Fromber, what makes him uh, miss, miss uh, hit stuff is like he's so erratic sometimes. So that's part of his game as well. So it's a weird thing because I've been in that zone where, where I'm trying to throw nasty stuff and then I try to pull off of it and then it goes up, up and away and all these other ways. So it's like he's going to have to figure out a way to uh, zone it in a little bit better and maybe take a little bit off so that he can be in the zone a little bit more so that, his, so that he can then throw his – uh nasty stuff so yeah he, he's definitely got to figure it out if they want to get to the back end of the of the of the of the bullpen um but uh i have faith in him his stuff is great i think he's uh, you know that the the coaching staff there in houston is, is great so i think he'll pull it together but he is going to be the key for this team do you think he you said you said he's got to take some off do you think his stuff He's a guy that if he takes some off, you know, he's not a, he's, I mean, he's got great velocity. I'm not saying he doesn't, but he's not like a throw the ball through the wall as hard as he can kind of guy. What kind of adjustments do you, do you think he needs to make if you're a curveball sinker ball guy, what is taking something off me? Well, I guess more so in like maybe changing your sights. So like yeah. figuring out like what your ball is doing that day, you know, like, all right, my curveball is breaking more east to west. Uh, or whatever it is, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of analyzing that in the bullpen. So with that, you're kind of changing your sights instead of like trying to keep throwing the ball in the same zone, trying to make this, this a similar break every time, because each day you pitch, your break is a little bit different or your fastball is doing something a little bit different. So making adjustments on the fly because the game is adjusted to him. So they understand that his stuff, he throws stuff that is, looks like it's in the zone, then goes out. So the hitters are, are waiting him out with that. So he's going to have to make the adjustment to adjust his sights 
to start putting some of those curveballs in the zone. Start, start, to, you know, starting to sinker in a different place so that guys are going to offer at it more and see and and honor that he will throw strikes with the, with that nasty stuff. So maybe not take off, but just you know zone in a little bit on on his sights to make his stuff be in the zone a little bit more so that he then can be out of the zone. I led you right into this one because this is what I meant to say. Do you think Maldonado not coming back is going to hurt the Astros more than the Astros even know? Having a good catcher is vital. I had some <laughs> of the best. I had I had JT oh, you had great I, ones. I yeah, I had Jeff Mathis. Like those guys were not only good at, at calling games and defensively, but they were like good uh therapists basically. That's what some pitchers need. They need someone to where they can pat you on the butt or you know light a fire under your ass or whatever it is to like so like that that is what Maldonado did. He was able to translate, he was able to take whatever energy that the pitcher was giving at that moment and then be able to give them what they needed in that moment to get the best out of them. So I definitely think that's going to be a factor with this team. Yep. Yadi Molina missing from the Cardinals last year. Did that matter? A little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. For sure. Um, so I'll use this Yankees game to jump us to the next game I want to cover, which is the Reds. Just want to throw this in there quick um, because it wasn't a close game. There wasn't anything super notable besides the fact that Frankie Montas debuted on a cold day. Six shutout innings, four hits, no walks, four strikeouts. So Yankee fans were fine because they got their dub. But Frankie Montas looks like he's kind of good. <laughs> and I know <laughs> Yankee fans were pretty pissed about the result. Obviously, he was going through injuries. And I think he was fighting it with the shoulder for basically two years. But when he's on the mound, he's a good pitcher. And the, the Reds thumped the the Nationals. So the two homers from Nick Martini, barely making the team. Uh, Josiah Gray didn't have a good day. But Frankie Montas started opening day, and they looked pretty good for it. He looks solid. Like, he looked like he, he figured out what he needed to be in that day. When you're dealing with shoulder injuries, uh, speaking from experience, that, that is tough to, like, because sometimes you're trying to figure out how to throw without pain. Right. So like it, that alters your mechanics. And then whenever you figure out that the only way to throw strike for me anyway, the only, the only way to throw strikes was to throw through that pain. Like your body almost when you get to that point where you start to feel that pain adjusts for you at the last second. And then the ball starts doing crazy things. And then you give up a home run to, to Kratz. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so like it, that can definitely affect you not only physically, but mentally as well. So, you know, now that he's fully healthy, you can see that he's healthy. He's throwing the ball with conviction. He has total confidence in his stuff, and it's it's amazing to see him out there on the mound. It's it's I I I enjoy watching him pitch when he's pitching like that. This is a team that's going to need him. This is a team that's going to need him. And I I bet against the I bet against the under on strikeouts for uh, Josiah Gray because I thought the Reds were going to do exactly what they did. I definitely wouldn't have said it was Nick Martini out of the eight hole that was going to give him two shots, but I also didn't think Josiah Gray was going to last long enough to get his five strikeouts. Well, he did, and so I'm 0-1 on the season. But this Reds lineup, every every season you're going to talk about, ah, you know, they were just decimated by injuries. Well, game one, the Reds lineup said, oh, I know we don't have our most productive batter from last year for the rest of the season. You know, we're going to add in there. We're going to give you a, a Spencer Steele right center. We're going to give you a TJ Friedel setting the table. We're going to give you a Jonathan India giving you good at-bats. And the meat of our order is going to fall on our face the first day. The guy, the only signing that we had gets three punchies, gets a, you know, gets a golden sombrero on the first day. Like, this lineup is deep. They will be able to withstand injuries that they're already being decimated by. And this – I I – I'm so excited over reaction that my pr my prediction is the Reds in the Central. <laughs> there you go. Um, and and I'll, I'll throw one more in on the AL Central side before we get to our next guest, because it's a quick one here. But the White Sox fall to the Tigers, one nothing. It's a really well-pitched game, of course. And it's both sides. So first off, if Tarek Skubal can stay on the mound, he's a Cy Young contender. There is no doubt about it. His stuff is ridiculous. And then Garrett Crochet made his first start ever, and they let him go six. It was great. Six innings, five hits, 
a run, eight punch outs, no walks. And also Kopech looked really good in the bullpen, saving them at one point. I think it was in the eighth with the bases loaded, gets the punch out. They just didn't have any offense against the Tigers staff. But great sign for the White Sox if Crochet is an upper echelon starter in the future. I know they're probably going to lose 100 games this year. And on the Tigers side, Kratz, if they can pitch like that, and they've got the young hitting like Cole Keith and um, and Riley Green and Spencer Torkelson and more on the way, Tigers could be a problem like we talked about. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good after day one because the pitching is more of the question mark there. And here's Crochet just mowing dudes down right now. <laughs> Crochet was just like, oh, yeah, I threw 106 out of the bullpen. I'll just come out and throw a hunch as a starter. Like he was – he was bringing it. That is huge for the White Sox. I get it. He's probably going to be capped at a certain amount of innings, like Chris Getz said here on the show on Wednesday. But that is huge for the White Sox. That is that is ability to maybe be better than the ace. You know, when we come down to the who's going to be the worst, if Crochet can give you 100 innings, it's not going to be all like this. But – it is going to be a huge level of embarrassment taken off if he can do that for them. Now, if you're looking at the Tigers, to me, Tarek Skubal was always going to be the ace of this staff. And this lineup is going to hit. It is cold in the AL Central for all of April, so hitting is not going to be their forte. But if they think Casey Mize, who hasn't pitched in two years, was good enough to make the team over Matt Manning, who gave them – quality innings, then this staff is exactly where they wanted it to be when A.J. Hinch took over and they had a three-year plan of these are the guys and this is what we're going to run with because this, I mean, Torkelson's going to hit 30. I think Riley Green's going to hit 30. I think the addition of um, – oh, freaking A. They're, the guy they got from the Brewers left field used to be the – Marcana. Mark, Mark Hanna, Hanna, I'll help you there. Now. And I got to take Thank over because our, our guest is ready. But Mark Hanna, oh, yeah, there's some dudes. He's going to give the lineup more more visual on you know being able to take pitches. Agreed. Agreed. That was a great pickup. All right, let's pick up our first guest player-wise of the day on FT Live. Tyler Kinley from the Colorado Rockies joining us right now. Tyler, great to have you on. And happy start to real ball. And hopefully you'll get in the game today. But how's everything going? Thanks for having me, guys. Uh we're excited. You know, last night, probably not the way you want to start the season uh, as a team. But you know what? It's just one inning. We got 161 uh, more games to go. We had a lot of good things going on for us in spring training. So we're excited to put that one past us and get rolling tonight. Do you feel like the Rockies, I mean, this is probably kind of an obvious question, but do you feel like they're they're overlooked? Um, the NL West got a lot of attention Every team was making pickups, even right towards the buzzer. Like, I think some Padres and Giants fans were sitting around like, are we going to do anything? This is our, our time to contend as well. And they did kind of late. So do you feel like the Rockies are, are staring at a bunch of teams that have made a lot of noise? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to compete with the the name power that keeps coming into our division year after year. You know, I feel like San Diego, there's been nobody off limits for them the past couple of years. You know, now the D-backs are in that mix. The Giants have been trying to find their superstar. Dodgers are obviously the Dodgers. Um, you know, yeah, we, we always feel like we're overlooked, but, you know, we don't mind that because we love the chip on our shoulder and we love trying to prove people wrong. You know, so for us, it's motivation. And for us, it's just a, an ability for us to keep our heads down and go to work every day. What up, TK? AJ, what's going on, man? Uh, not much. We So we, we work out together with it, within Cressy. So everybody that uh, out there doesn't know that uh, and play together as well. Um, so last year you got a few saves, right? So tell me what that process was like for you, like to get in those those pressure situations and how you're able to handle that. Because it is, even though you're still getting three outs in the game, there's still a little bit different feel to that. And I know that you're going to be used as an option as well, like it, it, during this season as well, um, to close out some games. So have you changed your routine or anything to be able to uh, handle that extra pressure that goes on closing out games? Not really. You know, I think, yeah, those final three outs are the hardest three outs in baseball to get. You know, that's why they're they're a premium and that's why they're, you know, so important. Um, but really, you know, getting back from injury last year, getting healthy, then, you know, closing some game, games out in the end was, a, you know, a great way for me to finish the year. Um, 
But I think most importantly, I'm just, you know, trying to stay in my routine, still got to get my outs, whether it's the seventh, eighth or ninth, you know, wherever it's at. Um, and then, you know, trying to be like you years ago when you were locking down all those games for, you know, us in Miami, just trying to, you know, do do the job to close the door and not add any uh, dramatics to the end, especially when the team's been busting their butts for, you know, seven, eight innings to get us a lead. You know, my job is just to come in at one point tor- towards the end and then close it out. We, we already yeah. showed a video. You don't want to be like AJ. Like, we already showed the video <laughs> at the beginning. Now he's coming on here saying his shoulder was shredded. Yelly texted me and said your shoulder was shredded. I hit a dinger off of him. So now all of a sudden, you know, so you you be you, okay? In well, he Colorado. shredded it twice. Yeah, AJ shredded, shredded it twice, twice, man. He got everything out of that shoulder. Yeah, and it's then he barely worked, hanging he on by a thread off right to come now. back too, man. I saw it firsthand. Yeah. He worked his butt off. That's awesome. Appreciate That's that, awesome. Man. Have they have they have they said the word closer to you, or have they said, you know, you'll be a priority inning guy, or have they done like their free agency this off season and said nothing to you? <laughs> yeah, it's a little more. It's a little more vague. Um, but you guys know how things go, right? Opening day, the roles that are set are never going to be necessarily the same roles throughout the seasons, uh, you know, especially in the bullpen. Guys get hot and guys cool off, whether it's usage, whether it's just stuff not working right. Um, but, yeah, I just know I'll be somewhere in the back and, you know, I'm going to be locked in, you know, ready for whatever inning that might be. Um, Tyler, can you give us the lowdown on some of the other pitchers that stood out to you in camp that you think could be, you know, kind of breakout candidates with the team? Yeah. Uh, I think starting rotation wise, uh, Ryan Feltner is a, a name to watch. I think his stuff is is very high, is a very high ceiling. Last year he had that kind of freak injury where uh, Cassianos hit a line drive back at his head, skull fracture. He was able to come back from that. Um, all spring, I mean, he's upper nineties as a starter. He's got electric stuff. I think if he trusts it in the zone, you guys will see him break out and take some major strides. Um, from the reliever standpoint, I think Justin Lawrence and Jake Bird are two names to definitely watch. I think they're kind of, you know, taking that step in that next level to becoming a leverage guy, a back end guy, and on a big league bullpen. And uh, I think they gained a lot of confidence and experience last year, and I think they're gonna really take off this year. This is a position player question, but it kind of applies to you pitchers. I always say, pitchers who have great seasons rarely are not backed by good defenders. Talk about Tovar and the reaction to his extension and from a pitcher's standpoint, not from, you know, how he hits or whatever that is, because his defense is, from what I've seen, elite. Dude, it's game changing. I mean, we we were ecstatic in the clubhouse. We've been waiting for this for, you know, about a year now. We're like, sign him, sign him for his number gets too big. Go get him, go get him. You know, so we were, we were fired up for him. He's such a, a mature, poised uh He's 22. You know, he played last year at, at 21 years old for the most part, and you would have had no no idea how young he was because of his maturity. But it's a game changer. You know, having a guy like him at short to anchor that position, it, it gives you so much confidence. Max, a gold glove third baseman. You know, Brendan Rodgers, a gold glove second baseman. Um, you know, KB is going to do great for us at first. Then you have a guy like Doyle up the min- middle as well, and Nolan and Chuck and, you know, some of the guys – we feel like our defense is such a strong suit. And for us, pitching wise, it's like just let them put it in play. We got so many gloves and arms out there that are going to change the game for us. So, who's next? Who else do you look at in the clubhouse on the position player side and say, sign this dude before he costs too much? Because that is the story of the Rockies right now, right? Like they're going through their rebuild, they're trying to get, you know, the next flashy young team together. Prospects are flowing through. So, does anyone else stand out like that? I think most obvious it's Nolan Jones. I think he put himself on the map last year, not even in a full season, the the things that he did and how he was able to carry us in many ways. I think he's the next building piece. Um, I think there's other guys on the team as well. I think there's some other guys in the minor leagues that are going to be coming up that, you know, hopefully have that same impact. But, you know, hopefully we're able to lock those guys down and, and they're able to get, you know, comfortable and know that they're set and know that now that they can just play and not worry about, arbitration, free agency, anything like that, you know, that they can just blossom into, you know, what we hope they'll be. Speaking of, of minor leagues, uh, I was looking at who you played for. So you played, you've been a grasshopper, a Zephyr, a muck dog, a hammerhead, and a jumbo shrimp. 
Which one of the names <laughs> do you like the best out of all that? A jumbo shrimp. Um, probably the jumbo shrimp because that one was like the biggest or even the baby cakes, they were just so drastic from like the norm that all of a sudden we're like, what's this logo going to look like? What's the uniform going to look like? What's the color scheme? Um, but since it happened, my first big change was in Jacksonville, probably the jumbo shrimp, that one going from the, the classic Jacksonville Suns that had been around for ages, you know, to jump into the jumbo shrimp. That one was a pretty cool transition. I appreciate all the corny minor league minor league names. I played for almost all the teams except for every one of those that you just mentioned. So I don't know what I did, how we never how we never crossed paths. You didn't make the big leagues till you were 27. And I'm sure you've been asked that the whole time. But in a player's show, we always have superstars on, guys who have careers like AJ's, you know, 99 career saves. A, you know, an injury derails him from being multi-time all-star. So a guy like you to get an extension that probably never blips the radar for a lot of superstars, what did that mean based on how the path that your career took? I mean, that, that was awesome. That was, you know, we're extremely fortunate to have had that opportunity to do that. But, uh, you know, nothing's ever been handed to me. I had one one college uh, opportunity to play at a small division two, took that, um, not even with the intention of pro ball, but more of like, hey, it's a good academic school and I can start my life. You know, if baseball happens, it happens. I was injured a lot. Um, and then climbing through the minor leagues, I just kept building momentum and, and just kept living and dying by my routine and, and by my confidence and just, you know, knowing that I could compete at the level and each level just changed. Like, Hey, now I can get to a ball. Now I can get to double a, now I can get to triple a. And then I got to the big leagues and, you know, from guys like, like C Shack, guys like AJ that I saw coming up in the minors, I, you know, you tried to learn from that weren't necessarily first rounders and, and big school guys with all these uh, accolades. I was just like, you know what, if I can put my head down and if I can compete with them and if I can outwork them and if I can work with those guys, I think I'm going to be a good spot. And, you know, Coming back from an injury, I had a big injury last year, was able to, you know, to get an extension uh, after that injury had happened. And, and um, you know, that's not very common for guys to be injured and then get extended. So we were happy to, to have that opportunity. And, uh, you know, career wise, I'm just trying to keep building momentum, just, uh, you know, staying with within my routine and uh, keep going out there until they kick me out, really. How did you gain confidence after injury? Because I know that's the biggest thing after you get injured. Uh, trying to reestablish that that confidence within yourself to know that you can compete like you like you know you can right and how do you not let that work because what I did I almost worked overworked to try to get back I always tried to try to be better than I ever was and that kind of was kind of like to the detriment of myself right so how did you keep it within the reins but also still believe that you can be as good as you once were or even better so what what are the things that you did to to achieve that well, I think, you know, when you come back from a major injury, position player, pitcher, regardless, there, there's no other choice other than to be confident. You got to put the costume on. You got to put the mask on every day, regardless, because if not, then it's just it can be a slippery slope. It can be quicksand at times. Um, so all I, all I tried to do was just to continue to believe that the surgery was done right. My rehab was going great and then just dominate each day. You know, even if it was as simple as getting the brace off and getting range of motion back, was, you know, I had to put my best foot forward each day for the little task at hand. And each day the task grew, they grew and, and got bigger and bigger. And uh, you just start to shift your focus into, okay, today it's rehab and okay, now it's now it's building back. Now it's rehab assignment. Now it's back in games. Now it's back in leverage situations. Now it's closing games, you know, so you just keep shifting the focus, but at the same time, you know, you just stay locked in and, and you can just really control what you can control. Tyler, I'll mix in one fan question here. Jacob wants to know the impact that Bud Black has on this team. And he is a pitching guy who obviously was brought in to help in an environment that is not ideal compared to the rest of the ballparks in the league. <laughs> yeah, uh, Buddy. So I always tell people, Buddy, Buddy is San Diego as a person. He's sunny in 75 every day. You know, regardless, wh whether it's last night's game or whether we, you know, whether we're on the other side of that and we're putting a beating on a team. He's always the same guy. He's always loose. He's always all about the guys. He, you know, likes to let us have fun and do our thing. And, you know, he's got his beliefs as a pitcher that, you know, now has shifted a little bit as a manager. And he's always, 
helpful in, in that regard with us because he can speak the lingo. He can, you know, talk the talk because he's already walked the walk with us. So that, that helps on the pitching side. And I think he's gained the respect of a lot of the position players too, you know, his tenure coaching. So, uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's San Diego as a guy. All right. You know, I mean, if you've seen the show, I'm going to give people a hard time. So we got to get a check. We got to get a check for you. Did you make your bed before you came on the show? Not today. See, I Not mean, now what is what is that teaching the kids at home? You're talking about process, and you didn't make your bed before you before you left the house. Unbelievable, AJ. Well, this is what you taught him. Is this what you taught him, AJ, in the bullpen? Come on, man. The first rule was no, always it, make your bed before you leave the it's house. Man. Yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. It doesn't look like a disaster. By the time I go to the field, always. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go, Kratz. It, it it looks like it looks like you're not like one of those crazy sleepers that's kicking sheets all over. Like it looks like it's it's in a decent spot. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's Kratz. yeah. No, I'm a creature. I'm a creature of habit. Same position, same pillow. Travel with my pillow everywhere. You know, I'm simple. Oh, you travel with your pillow that you use oh, yeah. in your hotel room. Oh, yeah. Is that the a guys thing? will tell you that the hotel pillows are, are the most misleading thing in, in baseball. They look fluffy and great. Then you get on them and it's a bag of air and you're right at the bottom. And then your neck hurts. And now we've got yep. so many excuses built for the next day on why we can't perform. Yep. Wow. You okay. You're, you're exactly right. You, you're exactly right. There you, was can't, the story. you can't use it. Kratz, yeah. did you see the story about Otani brings like the mattress pad with him that he folds up <laughs> and then uses it? Yeah, so true story. He's got a mattress pad that mimics his mattress at home and they have it in a briefcase that then rolls out and he puts on top So because he's like all about sleep. I know Verlander's big on that too. Like that is their focus, maximizing sleep potential and making sure it's perfect. So I didn't realize, do most guys carry pillows around? Brad Ziegler yeah, used to do that I think same it's thing. More common than yeah than you think, but that see that's Verlander and Shohei. That's that's balling on a different budget, right? They're bringing mattresses, <laughs> and, and I'm bringing a, a a pillow. You know, so it's that's a different ball game right there. You control what you can control, just like AJ said. You control <laughs> what you can control, but you can't right, be you pillow. can't be coming out. You can't be coming out, coming set and trying to look over at first like this. That's a balk, like, because your neck's all jacked up because you slept on one of them bad pillows in the Ritz. Thousand percent. Love that. Well, Tyler, awesome having you on here right after opening day. Hopefully you get in tonight's game in a tight situation. So um, good luck, and we'll catch you at some point during the season. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. Good luck the rest of the way, all right? Thank you. Yes, you too. Tyler Kinley joining us on FT Live. That was great. And I didn't even know there was the – AJ Ramos connection. So you guys worked out together um, in the off season a few times. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after I injured my shoulder, I went to work out at Eric Cressy's place, Cressy Performance in, in Jupiter, Florida, and uh, he he works out there. That's where he works out. That's where he lives. So we got to to work out there. We also played together with the Marlins um, and and the Rockies when I signed with them for for in twenty twenty uh so yeah we we got it we had some some run-ins together he's a great guy hard worker uh humble guy uh he's just he's, he's one of my favorite people to be around he's just positive all the time by the way before we get to our next seg you you were name dropping at the top of the show i'll just forget about it if i don't bring it up now what was it like to play with shohei otani did you have combos with him and you you had otani oh you tell me what year was that 21 and 22. Okay. Um, yeah, the guy was always working. Like, I, I never saw him chilling at his locker. He was, he was always doing something for hitting, doing something for pitching or working out. Like, I never saw him sit down. Uh, so I can see how it, it was. He's very mysterious. Like, you know, you don't know what he's doing because he's always it seemed like all he was doing was was putting in work and worrying about how to be better on the field. Uh, so I didn't see, I mean, he was, he was always working. It, it was, it was cool to see that, that type of commitment that he would put in on a daily basis. So, uh, yeah, he was always, uh, working. So I barely, I mean, I've maybe said, I don't know, like, uh, 10 sentences to him, you know, like, wow, that's a good workout. Yeah, that's about, that's about it. We, we never really had a conversation like that. Um, so yeah, yeah. But he he seemed like just the, the hardest worker that one of the hardest workers that I've been around. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, he's got to do two things. And also, 
I mentioned the sleep. I think he's a 12 hour guy. So if you do the math, you wake up, you only have 12 to work with. Already you're at a deficit. I mean, Kratz, you know me. If you do four or five, I got so much more life going on. Maybe not as much in the back end. I'm not really logging the back end. You know, the ba- the the last few holes might be a little dicey for me, but for now, I can get a lot more done. He wasn't the twelve hour guy. Who was the twelve hour guy? Was that was Kikuchi, that Ryu? No, Kikuchi said fourteen, oh, Kikuchi. and then it got 14. dumbed down to like ten to twelve. No, Otani. The story I read, I'm I'm pretty sure it was at least ten. I think it. Oh, you know what it was? So Stephanie Epstein just wrote about it. She said 10 plus two hour nap is the average day. That's 12. That's 12 down. There is no better if he works like AJ saying he works because I have I've never heard anybody say anything different than what AJ just said. You you're looking for them gains. And if you want gains, recovery is in your sleep. It's crazy to me when people are like, oh, man, you know, I'm just trying to get this. or I'm trying to improve that. I'm like, okay, how much you sleep? I get usually like seven and a half, maybe eight hours. So you put your body through an absolute grind and you rip it and you expect to just get enough sleep as regular people who sit at a desk every day. No, you need your sleep. Yeah, I like, I, like after I after I got injured, um, I bought me a hyperbaric chamber. Like, so I had, mm. I had surgery in, in 2018. Um, so after I had surgery, I bought a hyperbaric chamber. So I would, I would sleep from I don't, what 1130 to around six in the morning. And then I would go into the hyperbaric chamber for the, the last two hours of my sleep and get my last two hours in the hyperbaric chamber. So like I was sleep is, is very important. Um, and that recovery, especially from injury, or if you're playing, both positions you're playing uh, offense and defense basically you know you got you got to prioritize all that and do whatever you can to maximize uh, your body so that you can handle not only the stress but uh uh both of those uh you know hitting and pitching so it's 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 a it's crucial all right well hopefully your brain's well rested to try and pick a winner today so let's run our bet mgm locks nice and simple picking on one game that we like pitcher performance whatever it is right aj new to the party here so this is how we did yesterday uh aj fell with his bet pap won so he's up big to start he's gonna be wild uh i he's nailed mine Kratz went down you know he's gonna be wild i mean and we're probably not gonna have time to totally mix this in so i'll do it now but corbin burns debuting with baltimore the game was going on while we were finishing up FT, so I had an eye on it, and I see him strike out two, then give up a trout homer, and then he was like, yeah, that's it. You have one player on your team. And it's funny, I wrote down in my notes yesterday, just don't pitch to trout. The, the Angels offense is, is going to be like probably a bit below average. There's some other names in there, but when trout's healthy, just avoid him, and the rest of it should be smooth sailing. So here's Mr. Burns starting his Cy Young campaign, like Kratz predicted. Um, and the offense backed him up too, but six innings, one and run 11 strikeouts, no walks. It's pretty, pretty effing good heading into his free agent year. Yeah. I'm motivated. That's the song that's playing every single day. You can't, you can't extend me. I'm going to pitch so well this year. There's no way Baltimore's new ownership, Rubenstein, Rubenstein is going to have enough money to even pay. Just get, get the qualifying offer out. See ya. I'm going to the highest bidder. Whatever Cole is going to get with his extension, that's what he's getting. And he showed it on opening day. Yeah, there man. You go. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And uh, that team is going to be on fire too. Like I'm really oh. excited to watch that team play. Like he he did he did well. He's going to be he's going to fit in perfect there. I think it's going to add just to what they got going on. And I'm excited to watch what they do the rest of the season. This is going to be an exciting team. Yeah, I went O's money line yesterday. No sweat bet day one. It's always nice. Nice start. So, Kratz, what was yours, by the way? I went under on K's for Steele and Josiah Gray because I heard their their pitch count wasn't all the way built up. Well, their pitch count wasn't all the way built up, and they both got six punches. Mm. Hmm. So, you got hooked. That's what, that's what I get for hooked. going too deep dive. Shouldn't have gone too deep yep. dive. All right, so then what do you have for today? Are you going simpler? I'm going more Kratz style. I'm going Kirby over 
six Ks and I'm going Pavetta over six Ks. Both of them hit shoot. Pavetta went seven and 10, his last two starts against Boston. And he was averaging six and a half Ks in his last 15, 12 starts last year. So he's going to continue to K the Mariners K a lot. And George Kirby is an absolute beast as we hit on yesterday. I don't see how this guy doesn't finish top five in the Cy Young this year. You have him, you have him finishing number one, but I have him top five. So six plus Ks for both, and that's coming out at plus one twenty-five for a hundred dollars. Get myself back into positive. There you go, AJ. What about you? Where are you looking? Uh, I'm taking the money line. I'm gonna go for the upset with Philly over the Braves. Uh, it's a home game for the fit for the for Phillies. And I think, you know, that environment is already tough to play for play in whenever you're an opposing team. And that vibe, the vibe of the team, what they're bringing, you got Wheeler on the mound just signed uh, that new deal. He's one of the best pitchers in the game. I, I, I'm going for the upset on this one. I'm putting uh, I'm putting 100 to win 105. Um, and I'm always going to choose the underdog because I'm an underdog myself. So I'm always going to go with the underdog and you make a little bit more money that way too. So that's going to be my bet. I like that. My only issue is, are they going to be able to beat that bullpen? Because Strider has dominated the Phillies in the regular season. That, I was looking at that. I was looking at, that's another one. It's a K prop. The over for K's there is eight and a half. And he struck out 12, 10, 9, 9, 10, 12 in his last regular season starts against the Phillies. Like domination city by Strider. Well, that's going to be home year, playoff man. vibes. New yeah, year. yeah. New year. I like and it's that. Philly. It's I mean, year. Philly in the playoffs, is, is it's a crazy scene. It's going to be like that for day one. You know it. So, yeah, that's, that's a fun game to watch. I'll go kind of try and keep it simple. I'm going to do another run line. Dodgers to pound the Cardinals again. I mean, we heard from Katie Wu earlier, the Cardinals are already going with their sixth starter on game two against a ridiculous Dodger offense. I'm a big Bobby Miller fan. I think he's going to shove. So I think the Dodgers could blow out the Cardinals. That's at minus 120. I'll throw down 120 to win 100. I know it's nothing crazy, but you're like, that's that's not bad. I mean, I think later in the year, when you get comfortable with how good the Dodgers offense is, that, that number against the Cardinals is probably going to be like a minus 150. You know, so right now, while everyone's kind of learning, it's at minus 120, so I'll take it. Um, those are our locks for the day. And we are picture. introducing – what? That's, that's a great picture. picture. Before you do your CTA, that picture is fire. That's a good picture, man. They got my good side right there. That looks yeah. good. Yeah. For you. <laughs> Looking like a model. I like it. Um, <laughs> introducing our MLB Grand Slam jackpot. So if you're on the BetMGM app, it's a weekly bet and get promotion. You place a $10 or higher wager on any player to hit a home run every weekend, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. And the player, if the player hits a Grand Slam on that day, you can win the $50,000 daily prize or a share of the prize with every other winning better. So make sure you check that out. Gambling problem or concern, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And we are ready to go with our next guest who was part of what I would call an historic day in Oakland for the opener between the Guardians and the A's. Paul Hoynes joining us, Cleveland Guardians beat writer for cleveland.com. You can listen to his Cleveland Baseball Talk podcast as well. Hoynesy, great to have you on. How was that unique opening day? We'll get to the game in a sec, but the scene there was much more of a party outside of the ballpark than in it. Yeah, definitely. There was, uh, you know, there was some security there before the game, but uh, Oakland fans showed up, and I guess they decided not to go into the ballpark. They just decided <laughs> to party outside of maybe their 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 form of protest. Yeah, and that, that is exactly, just to clarify for fans you know, new to this, that's exactly was the plan. It was to have a big block party outside of the park as, as they're trying to basically Hoenzi, peacefully protest that the team is leaving them. They're not treating their fans well on the back end of this. So they're like, we're going to support this team but not give the money to the owner, John Fisher. We're going to have a party here. We've got some video of it as well. So inside looked pretty bleak. Hoenzi, I think the message was sent because they'll show up in droves if you take care of them. 
Yeah, it looked like old Cleveland Stadium there. You know, when you could hear, uh, you could hear from the press box, you could hear the umpires, what balls and strike calls. So, but there was like third. They uh, the announced attendance was thirteen thousand, I think, just over thirteen thousand, uh, and it sounded like there was a lot of Cleveland fans there. Yeah, if you're on the podcast side, we're looking at a photo from opening day in Oakland, and it's pretty empty. So, I think message sent. Kratz, we had been talking about this message sent. It looked like a rager on the outside. Um, all right. Successful. So, yeah, successful message sent. Good job by Last Eye Bar and Oakland 68s and the whole fan base there. All right. So inside, Hoinsey, the Guardians looked pretty damn good as expected. It's going to be a tough year for the A's. And I think the story, of course, is Shane Bieber because he did some things differently in the offseason. And do you think that Shane Bieber is going to be able stuff wise to get back to the Bieber that we've seen several years back? You know, he, he really, uh, it, it looks that way, you know, one start, you can't, you know, buy too much into that, but, uh, you know, he, he really kind of dedicated himself, changed his routine over the winter, went to driveline in Scottsdale, uh, picked up some missing velo that he's, you know, has been in decline since, probably when he won the uh, Cy Young in 2020, uh, and that has helped his other pitches. You know, he's he's kind of un- unveiled his changeup again, uh, and uh, that was a pitch he's, he's kind of stayed away from for the last couple of years because there wasn't a whole lot – there wasn't a big gap between his changeup and his fastball. So did the changeup just stay where it was supposed to be and then the fastball rose up? Is that what you're saying? Like the velocity yeah, went up big- and the changeup didn't? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the fastball uh, is like he's thrown between 92 and 94 now. Uh, you know, with, it average was 91 last year. And uh, he's, he said that he's been working on it for a decade to try to take some velo off the uh, changeup. But finally, he just said, I'm just going to throw it and let it move, you know. All right. So how many starts is Shane Bieber going to make for the Cleveland Guardians this year before he is traded? Or is he not <laughs> going to get traded? Well, you know, I think uh, I think it's you know the the mo of the organization says they're going to trade him. Uh, you know, they've traded Cy Young winners in the past. Uh, this is a guy that really I think they would have traded at the deadline last year if uh, he didn't uh, hurt his elbow. You know, you know, right around the the you know that that period of time. So I would think uh, you know the odds are that that Bieber will get traded by the by the deadline, or if they're in contention. Who knows? Maybe they ride them out. They've done it before with certain players, but uh, one way or the other, I, I I do not see him in a Cleveland uniform next year. What about Emmanuel Classe? Do you think he will be unloaded this year as well? If they're not contending, obviously. I don't. I do not think that. I mean, they've got him on a great deal. You know, five years, twenty twenty million dollar deal. You know, when you compare it to Hader and. Uh, the other, some other closers that have signed since that deal, uh, you know, this is this is a guy that's – he has saved 86 games in the last two years. He's made – in the last three years, he's made over 200 appearances. I mean, if it I, – I just think, you know, uh, if, if this guy I, – I, I just can't see him trading them. I, I really can't. They've, they've – you know, they've got the best closer in baseball for the last two years on, on a great deal. And uh, if his arm doesn't fall off, I think they're going to keep him. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious for more on this. You know, his name popped up in some trade discussions in the offseason. And you know what's funny? I'm monitoring social and our, our YouTube channel yesterday. And people that are concerned about their bullpen are like, oh, we need Class A. We need to trade for Class A at the deadline as if it's a sure thing that this is a guy that's going to get dealt based on the combos from the offseason. And when we heard about this in the offseason, Hoinsey, I was like, why? Like the way you're explaining it, he is a cheap closer who can lock down games for you. You don't have to worry about an arbitration battle because that's already been decided via extension. So the only reason I could think of them shopping someone like Class A is that maybe they're not as high on him long term. Like, did they not like what they saw from him last year because it was a down year as far as the results, the peripheral numbers and the stuff still looked great? Yeah, I think when you're the Guardians, you have to listen to everything. You have to listen to offers on your best players because you're not going to go out and spend. You're not going to spend a whole lot of money, um, you know, 
on a payroll on free agents. So I think, you know, that that caused some of that. That caused some of those rumors. You know, they were listening. They listened to the offers. Uh, but I think in the end, I, I can't see them t- trading them. I mean, maybe I'm wrong there, but I just think you've got a great deal on a, on a great arm there. And I think the, the big thing is for them to take care of that arm, not, have, not run them out there 75 times a year. Well, do they listen to everybody? Because they listen to everybody on trades, but did they listen to anybody about adding some thump to the outfield lineup? Is there any hope that there's going to be more home runs, even though, you know, the scapegoat's going to be Miles Straw? You know, well, they, they took him they took him off the roster, and, you know, he's going to be in AAA making his few million dollars. Or Are they going to address this issue? And the thing that they've addressed this issue with, is it going to work? Yeah, they, uh, you know, they finished last in the league in home runs last year, second last two years ago. They were 27th in runs scored last year. Um, it, it's they, they have taken the approach, the front office has, that we want to see our young players advance. We want to see our young players develop. We don't want to bring in, you know, stopgap free agents to a get in their way. Now, <laughs> Whether that, you know, that's, and they believe that, you know, guys like uh, Will Brennan and, uh, and, uh, you know, guys like uh, uh, Quan and, and, you know, Tyler Freeman, you know, their young players are going to, you know, take a step forward this year. And that, that's a big leap in faith. Quincy, are they trying to operate at a much lower budget long term now? Because, you know, when they were, good and a world series team against the cubs in 2016 they did push some chips in it doesn't seem like they're into doing that anymore i'm curious if they're looking at a club like baltimore and even you know a mini version of the rays and just deciding that long term they're going to go along the route of not spending much in free agency yeah no i think they will spend it in certain situations um they brought in, uh, you know, uh, they brought in, uh, you know, Josh Bell last year. It didn't work too well. Mike Zanino last year. It didn't work too well. Uh, but I think when they feel they they are a contender, they will spend. Uh, but right now, I don't think they're. They feel like they're one 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 or two players away. What about uh? What, what do you what do you got on uh, Tristan McKenzie? How's he been? How's he looked this spring? And uh, what do you expect out of him this year uh, on his comeback year? Yeah, McKenzie uh, has looked good in spring training. Um, you know, last last time out against uh, Arizona in the final exhibition game of the spring, he uh, went six innings, struck out seven guys. Velo is 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 okay. Uh, they're he's going to start the first game in uh, Seattle. So he's basically their fifth starter. They're giving him an extra day uh, here. He's not going to pitch in Oakland. So, uh, you know, they're going to be careful with him. I think they've kind of got their fingers crossed that there's no more, you know, his, his elbow has, has been totally rehabbed and uh, we'll see how it goes. But right now he's, he's had a great spring. And he's 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 looks like he's ready to rejoin the rotation because he had a he had a tough go last year. How has my guy voter Stephen Vote done trying to fill the shoes of longtime manager Terry Francona with this clubhouse, but also connecting with you, tough tough Cleveland media? <laughs> I don't know if we're that tough. <laughs> you're no, not. You're not. No, he's- yeah, he's done a great job. He really does. Uh, as uh, you know, he uh, I think he's related to the ball club. And he the the first the best thing I think he said right away is that he's not Tito Francona. He you know he's you know he's and uh, you know he's asked Tito for some advice at, at time to time. But you know, he's definitely his own guy. And he you know he makes. You know, he, he, he said you can't follow a legend. You can't follow a guy like that. You, you have to be your own guy. You know, he's very forthcoming that, you know, he doesn't know everything about managing, that he's going to learn on the job. I think, uh, you know, they had a great vibe in spring training, and he's been uh, excellent with the media. I got one more for you, um, Hoinsey. Nolan Jones thrived with the Rockies. 
Will Benson looks really good with the Reds. I know everybody goes through that. You know, Cardinals fans go nuts about Randy Rosarena and some other players that they let go, right? Um, Adolis Garcia, Junior although Caminero. anyone could have had a chance. Junior mm. Caminero. Oof. Yeah, don't forget him. People don't know that name. They're going to know. That is, that is a special talent. So I'm curious about what they didn't like with those players. You know, it – Nolan Jones came on our show last year and basically said he thought they didn't like some swing and miss in his game. And the, I love, I think a lot of us love watching contact, right? You hate seeing all the strikeouts, but did they kind of go too overboard with evaluating some players on um, a little bit of swing and miss that could have been corrected or could have turned into power that they needed? Yeah, I think that this is why they're sticking with their young players longer. You know, they, they got burned by uh, Benson. They got burned by Nolan Jones. Caminero was just a bad trade. He was he and they admitted that that, you know, he was he was in the organization for like a half a year, you know, in, in the Dominican Summer League. And uh, they made the deal. And I, I that's probably one they're, they're going to live the regret. But like, no, like you said, Nolan Jones and, and Benson, what they're both big left handed hitters power hitters with a lot of swing and miss. And I think that played into that. Um, I also think that, you know, they just didn't, you know, Benson, I thought got a chance here, but Nolan Jones, you know, he, he, they, they acted so fast on that. And I know he had been hurt a lot, you know, coming up through the minors, but it just seemed like they pulled the trigger way too fast on that. And that's, that's what they need. They need a power hitting outfielder and they've, you know, they've gone through two of them. You have covered this. You've been a beat writer since 1983. Am I correct with saying that? Yeah. So you are on your 41st season. You are, you are older than every player you have been, you have been doing this longer than every player so when somebody comes to you and says favorite road restaurant breakfast lunch or dinner and i know you don't get many dinners in a lot of cities where would it be and is it still open (laughs) yeah god i'm I'm, um what uh i'm trying to think um well, <laughs> Cheesecake Factory, does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Was that around in 83? No, but, I, but yeah, uh, I was eating at McDonald's in 83, but no. Uh, what's the place in uh, Seattle, the, the old restaurant, the old the famous restaurant? Um, not the Metropolitan Grill. Uh, there's, there's, you know, really like there's a there's a great restaurant in Seattle that that I, I really like. Uh, I can't think of the name though. But it's been we'll around for it. a long time. Yeah, yeah we'll it's find been it. around. I'm for sure a long our time. okay, our our fan base will probably find it in the next minute or two. They're usually good at that. But Hoinsey, great to have you on. Uh, appreciate the time. Enjoy uh, game two of the season, and uh, we'll catch you down the road. Okay. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, uh, Paul Hoynes. You can follow him uh, nice and simple at Hoynes, H-O-Y-N-S-I-E on Twitter. And we'll post some of these clips as usual. Okay, let's get back to a few things from opening day. And while we're on the AL Central, I did want to point out the other notable injury from yesterday. So we covered the NL Central injury with Justin Steele. That's a bad one for the Cubs as he heads to the IL. But also Royce Lewis goes down. Just had him on the show a couple weeks ago. Kratz, he, he homered in game one. He looked like the regular Royce Lewis, two for two, had a dinger, but he's running the bases and leaves with a quad injury. And he's played 70 games so far in his big league career. He's dealt with two torn ACLs. Last year, he's missed some time with the oblique and the hamstring. When he's on the field, he is all-star level production. And Twins fans are frustrated because they have a few players of this ilk that have had trouble staying on the field. Of course, Buxton, Lewis for now. You could make a case with Correa. He's dealt with some things, you know, some chronic injuries. He looked really good yesterday, too. Maybe not as much as the other two. I, I get it. But but he's got some things he's going to work with for the rest of his career, and he's been very public about that. So the Twins might be held back by this. I, I think they're more reliant on their offense this year. Eh, maybe that's overstating it because they have a great bullpen, too. So it's kind of an – right? I mean, the bullpen's great. 
Pablo Lopez is great. There's some question marks beyond that in the rotation, but they need these stars in the lineup. Otherwise, I don't think they're going to be a World Series threat. The division, they're in good shape. Because the picking people have stopped picking Byron Buxton, they had to say, who's a dark horse to win the MVP? And I don't even think he's a dark horse if he stays out there. And it sucks to see his smiling face running around the bases in his first at bat or his first dinger. And then he's on base again. And you see him limping off with a quad injury. Like it, it, it just, it sucks because this guy and not because oh seventy 70 games, the small sample size. Yeah. But his sample size, if you delve into it, he smashes everything. And you saw it in the playoffs a little bit. He had an opportunity to play and they were like, okay, like, Let's just relax. Let's make sure we keep you out there. And there's that's no way to win an MVP. You can't relax and like just, uh, you know, kind of just play your position halfway and run the bases halfway. You can't. He only knows it one way. And an injury like this, does it decimate the Twins? No, it doesn't decimate them. It does keep them from reaching the peak that I think a lot of people thought they would reach. And I think he, if he is healthy, is an MVP candidate because of how he can smash every pitch, every pitch across the zone. Yeah, I think the big thing is too, or one of the big things is when you play not to get injured or when you focus on not getting injured, it almost brings that type of energy to yourself. So, you know, I'm not saying that's what he's doing or anything like that, or that the team is trying to, the team is doing that. But, yeah, it, it, it does suck because I know, you know, the amount of uh, work that, that these guys put in on a day-in, a day-out basis. And for you to get hurt, especially he's, he's been hurt, a, you know, a little, a little bit now, um, it, it, it's tough to watch a guy like that. His, his vibe after the game, um, you know, he was talking about he just felt, felt blessed to be able to be a part of opening day and play in it. And uh, that lets me know that he's he's got the right mindset that this is maybe hopefully just like one of those fluke injuries that he's going to get back into whatever he needs to do to to uh, uh, come back into the game with the right mindset and play the game uh, with, with the type of passion. And when you play that way, your, your level of play elevates because if you're trying too hard to do certain things or you're trying not to get hurt or you're trying to play good, those are things that when you're in the trying mode, you're, you're not at your best. When you kind of have a, a little bit of a, of a relaxed feeling, but a sense of urgency, it's just walking that line, just that fine line. That's whenever you, you play at your best. And I think with that mindset that he has, I think he has a, a good chance of finding that, that, that good line and be able to go out there and do what we all know he can do. Also stand out from this game, Pablo Lopez against Cole Reagans was nice. Both of those guys are Cy Young contenders too. You know, the the sizing up the AL Cy Young Kratz is going to be interesting because there's some guys I like. It's just I have injury concerns. Like I was between Lopez and um, and Kirby, and I went with Kirby. Reagan's is nasty. Scoobal is nasty. They just have a long checkered injury history. So for me, I'm like, are they going to get to 180 plus innings where I feel pretty good? about the other two. That's how I sized it up. Obviously Cole's out, so he's not going to win the award this year, but both of those guys are great. And yes, Lopez picked up in the trade, but also Cole Reagan's picked up in the Araldis Chapman trade immediately becomes their ace. What a, I mean, man, what a, what a reach. How did, how they got him out of the Araldis Chapman trade? Like I have no idea, but good for the Royals. My biggest thing with those two guys, Scooble and Reagan's, what kind of contact and miss are they going to – if you're talking about Cy Young level, are they going to get on their third and fourth pitches? Not their secondary. Reagans is going to throw – I mean, Scooble is too. They're going to throw that speed ball by guys and enough of a wrinkle from their arm angle. Each of them is a unique arm angle from the left side that it's you're going to get a lot of guys. To get to that next level – I don't think either of those pitches are elite next level to get you to that Cy Young, and that's why I went Burnsy and why I agree with your Kirby pick too. Like I feel like Kirby, if he can't get his third and fourth pitch to an elite level, he'll just learn a new one and he'll be like, yeah, I'll go ahead and ath athletic up this pitch. Oh, you want me to throw a knuckleball? That was a cool pitch I threw on the last day of the season. <laughs> 
Well, and also, too, uh, Pablo Lopez, too, can be looked at up there as well. I mean, he came into the field dressed like Morpheus. I don't know if you guys saw that. So I don't know if it would be hard <laughs> to bet against Morpheus, man. And, you know, he has he's a guy that can grind out innings. Uh, he can go to his second and third and fourth pitches uh, uh, to get through outings. He's just he's just a gamer, man. So, like, you know, uh, be, I, I was around him uh, for a little bit in, in Miami uh, in some workouts and stuff, too, as well. So he's just he's a guy that has that grit. He goes out there. He's going to give you, uh, you know, five plus at least, you know, and he's going to do it uh, at a high level as well. So that, that you know, Pablo Lopez is, is uh, he should be up there as well for sure. Another opening day shout out. So the Red Sox took down the Mariners. We'll see if Kirby gets them on the winning side of things in game two here. And I am a little concerned about the Mariners offense in general. We've talked about that. But on the Boston side, it's the opposite. You're super worried about the pitching. I actually think they could start out decently. um, But eventually, I think the pitching is going to be a big problem and they're going to collapse. You know, in the second half of the season, they'll really pick up L's in my mind. But Tyler O'Neill looks pretty damn good. Opening day is his thing. So that's his fifth opening day homer. Only player to do that, right? Five for five in opening days. Breaking a tie he had with Yogi Berra, Gary Carter, and Todd Hunley. The catchers, I guess, love opening day because then you guys get beat up the rest of the way. <laughs> guys, are, fresh. guys are fresh. Guys yeah. are fresh opening day. And then, and then they're like, oh, I got to catch 140 more of these. No way. Nah, that's, that's unbelievable. Five opening day home runs makes you kind of think like what is that is there something to that is there something you know is there more energy to that does he play hurt aj can probably attest to this like opening day guys feel 100 percent. nothing hurts and you're out there especially position players you're out there sprinting in the outfield you're like i'm i let's go this is what i need so you know does he play the rest of the season hurt and then you know it's it's one of those things like you're just you're you're in it to win it the first day and how do you carry that mindset i know i hit two in the minor leagues two opening day home runs so that's fun does that count (laughs) uh i guess yeah it can count it counts um but yeah like yeah like you said you're carrying around like this crazy energy on the opening day you're just fired up uh he's also probably the most jack guy in the league by the way you see, like, he's huge. That guy is huge. Um, so carry, carrying around that weight all year, maybe wears on him. I'm just, I'm just playing. But, uh, no, so, like, I, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're jacked up like that, you know, especially as a catcher, that, I mean, that amount of work, I can I can imagine, weighs on you. So uh, he, he just, he, yeah, he's just an opening day guy. It's, it's amazing to watch that. Somebody had him. So- somebody had him as an MVP candidate last, no, not last year, the year before. Guys were having hit saying Tyler O'Neill, he's going to hit 40 this year, MVP. I wish I remember who was saying that. Somebody prominent, like, this is the guy that I'm leaning on. And I was like, whoa. I've been a big fan, Kratz. I mean, he, he's been hurt. I don't think he was a fit in St. Louis based on, you know, a variety of reasons. The, the Cardinal way wasn't working for him at some point, right? Um, kind of a quirky guy, but yeah, he's super strong, super talented when he's on the field. I wouldn't be surprised if you heard that. What was the big year for him? He had one monster season, 2021. So if you heard someone say, hey, he might be an MVP in 2022, it wouldn't be crazy. In 2021, he was 286, 352 on base, 560 slug. He had 38 home runs, I don't know, 34 home runs and had a 148 OPS plus. And I think he won a gold glove that year as well. Yeah. So coming off that year, Sure. I mean, he finished top 10 MVP voting that year. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just, I, I never saw it, but that ball he hit last night, dude, righties, righties to go to right center in Seattle. That is a graveyard late night. Stayed on that slider. See ya ball. Yeah, dude. He yeah, is. He, he backspun that one out. Ooh, did yeah, he? For right? Oh, baby. He's 28 years That's old beautiful. too. I, you know, th- th- he could have his best few years coming up here with Boston. You know, it's a nice park to hit the baseball in versus St. Louis. It's definitely a big change. Pitcher's park to a hitter's park for him. And he had the quote from Alex Cora on why 
he was starting against a right-handed pitcher on opening day. And of course, said, I'm 0-5 on opening day. He has homered in four straight opening days. Sometimes you get to just press the button and see what happens. I like that. Love that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like you said, like changing teams as well, like changing vibes, it, it, it you know, that, that could also play into that as well, too. So, like, uh, there's different vibes in different clubhouses, different organizations. So maybe the Red Sox will fit him more. So you, you never know. There's so many factors that vary into that. Um, and if you're in the big leagues, man, you have a shot to be one of the best. You're, <laughs> you, you, you're, you got a shot every time. That's what that was my thought anyway. You know, people may have looked at my skill set and been like, oh, OK, yeah, he's he'll 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 be good for a little bit up there. And I end up being an all star. Right. Like many people maybe didn't even think that. So like. If you have the work ethic, you have the drive, you have the belief in yourself, more, most importantly, if you believe you're an MVP, if you believe you can achieve it, there's nothing stopping you. You know what I mean? So uh, if he has that belief in himself, like I, I'm not going to bet against anybody that has a belief in, him, in himself like that. So, Jay, did you ever deal with any beef that, that you experienced either with a coach or that you observed another player dealing with. I bring it up because week one of the season last year, I think it was after the first or second game, Ali Marmol called out Tyler O'Neill, and we covered it, of course. And it just set a bad tone for the team, for the player, even if you were dealing with something. And we love the the honesty always, and we want people to speak out, but it seemed pretty aggressive. And it really was the beginning of the end. Everyone's like, this dude's not lasting another year with the team, but... Did you experience anything like that during your playing days? I got lucky. I I didn't have any teammates that I disliked. I think, uh, yeah. So I never had any any issues with anybody like that, or any or saw any issues. Uh, if there were issues, the guys handled it behind closed doors, and it wasn't like a public thing. I mean, that's the way you should handle it on a team. Um, I feel like is is behind closed doors as men, you know, speaking to each other. Um, but yeah, I, I was lucky to never be involved or see anything like that. Cause that is, a, that disrupts the whole vibe of the locker room and people feel like they got to pick sides or walk on eggshells. And that's just not the type of energy you want to have when you're going out there and try to win, you're on the same team. You know what I mean? You're trying to win as many ball games as possible. Uh, so, you know, when you're, when you're fighting against each other and not against the other team, it's, it's just not a, a good vibe to have in the clubhouse. You played, I'm sure with. I'm trying to look up the stats right now. Yeah, you played with Miguel Rojas. Did you see the Jazz Chisholm versus Miggy Rowe beef I did. from a week ago? I did. I, I, I didn't I didn't read too much into it, but I did hear about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've never <laughs> when I played with Miggy Rowe, like he was just he was just coming up with us. Uh, he we got traded from the from the uh, Dodgers over to us. Um, I saw nothing but but great things from him, and he was a, a stand-up guy. He was a great guy. But that doesn't mean that maybe another person experienced a different version of him. We're, we're all human. We all uh, do say something, and maybe it could be taken the wrong way or whatever. I, I'm not saying that's what happened to Jazz. I'm just saying that I could see a possibility that maybe I said something to someone uh, and didn't mean it a certain way, and then it, it's taken the wrong way. So I, I don't know what exactly was involved with all that stuff, but – I do know, like, pro- like before uh, coming up, before I came up, I know, like, you know, Christy, you could probably speak to this, but I feel like a lot of the veteran guys were, were more hard on rookies uh, um, more often, and they made, it, they made it almost uncomfortable to be on the team sometimes. That's from my experience, from, from what I heard from other people's stories. But I was lucky enough to whenever I got called up and whenever I was a veteran too, like I would give the rookie some shit every once in a while, but like in a loving way, you know, but Hey, go get my coffee or whatever. You know what I mean? But then I would always be for them whenever they uh, um, had a bad outing or whatever it is. I was always there because they're on your team. <laughs> they're trying to help you win the ball game as well. So why would you want to make someone feel miserable uh, who is on your team? Cause that's not going to help you guys win ball games. You know what I mean? So uh, I don't know what happened. I haven't uh, dug into it. Uh, but, uh, you know, apparently it wasn't good on, from jazz jazz's perspective. And I, I don't know if I've heard anything from, from Miggy. Um, have you guys, I, I saw, so, so Kratz knows, uh, JS nine innings. who's like a super influencer on, on Instagram. Our, our friend, Josh, he posted about it, just like documenting what, what was said from jazz. And then he sent me a screenshot where, uh, Miggy Rowe, um, posted a comment on it 
just like raising his hand like yep that was me so i think that was real <laughs> i have to look but just be I, because i mean it sounded like wh what did he say kratz like he put something in his shoes or something in his locker right wasn't that the story put something in jazz's I, he, he did some prank he, or he cut that, up that his jazz shoes pointed or something? out i think he, i think he i think he cut his shoes he cut i think him, he cut, yeah. cut the laces of his shoes and you got yeah i mean like aj said like some guys it's funny because I don't know. I don't know how Miggy Rowe, when he came up, what the veterans were like, but it's funny because most of the time when somebody was hard on the rookies, they were treated poorly as a rookie. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, when I, when I asked those guys, I'm like, so you were treated terribly as a rookie. And now you're like, I'm going to treat a rookie terribly. And I'm not saying that's the situation here. Cause you know, jazz talked about, how he was yelling at a you know, I think he was talking about Isan Diaz and, you know, just not making, not making it comfortable in the clubhouse is different than treating rookies bad. Like, I don't understand. Like if you got treated poorly and you're like, I hated it. I hated when he treated me like that. Why are you going to go around and turn around and do that to somebody else? Like, stop the cycle, stop the cycle where you're at. Like there's a difference between exactly what AJ said Hey, go get me some coffee, rookie, and then like pouring it out. Like that's funny. To be rating somebody on the bench every day they come in. My buddy was a first, he was top four pick. He was going to be the future of a team. And there was two pitchers on his team that every single day it made him not want to come to the ballpark. He could not have, he was like, I was so relieved when I got traded from that team because big league pitchers, guys, you would know their names would literally sit, stand next to him and yell in his ear about something that he was doing wrong. He was, he was five minutes early before stretch. What are you, you know, are you a, are you just a brown noser? Are you kissing up to the teacher? He was a minute late one time. He's like, Oh, now you're better than all of us. He hits her one time. Oh, yeah, you want to hit home runs. You're taking guys' jobs. Why don't you know your place? He's like, it was miserable. He said the best time was flights when they would get drunk and forget about them. And that's miserable. Yeah, that that's I, I was lucky to have uh you know, Ricky Nolasco was a veteran on on with the Marlins when I came up. Bro. And he so when I got called up, uh, you know, you get seven and seven, you get the uh, the hotel for seven days and when my seven days was up he was like hey uh where are you staying i was like oh at the hotel he's like no no you're not you're staying with me i got an extra room i was like okay cool he's like what are you driving i was like uh oh, a cabin to the field and he was like no you can drive my beamer it's it's, it's my one of my extra cars I, I was like yo this is so dope he's like i don't want anything from you all i ask is that whenever you're in a position that i'm in that you do the same thing for somebody and he was there he he, he gave me a kick in the ass when i needed it he, uh, you know, uh, consoled me when I needed it. You know, like he was also the one that told me like uh, one day I, I pitched bad and I was sitting in the room and he's like, hey, you want to go out to dinner? Because in Miami, you can go out to dinner at, at midnight, you know, so uh, he's like, you want you want to go to dinner? And I was like, no, nah, man, I pitched bad. He goes, hey, man, let me tell you something. He was like, when you walk out of that locker room, no one should ever know how good or bad you did. You know, once you're out of there, leave that, leave that, leave it at the field, man. I'm, I don't want to hear that. He was like, so now what do you want to do? You want to go to dinner or you want to stay here? And I was like, well, let's go to dinner. You know what I mean? So like, that's the type of person that you need, I feel like for these rookies, because um, again, you, you want them to be the best. You want them to be their best version because they're going to help you win the ball game. So I never got like, being making it so uncomfortable that a guy doesn't want to come to the damn field like that just didn't make any sense um so that I, i'm glad that i never had to deal with that and i didn't see anybody else deal with that in the locker rooms that i was in but again like it, it could have been done in a different way that i never saw i um, mean if i ever saw someone doing that as a veteran i would definitely step in and say hey what, what the hell are you trying to do to this kid man like this guy's just trying to be trying to be good uh trying trying to win us ball games and another thing too I know somebody came in uh, and did well, uh, pitched, it was, it was a reliever, came in, did well, struck, you know, did, um, got one, two, three inning. And uh, <laughs> the guys came in and was like, hey, well, you got to do that again tomorrow. Like, don't don't get all happy. And they kind of said it in a way like that was like demeaning to the kid. 
And I was like, why, why, why are you trying to make the game harder to this guy? The game's hard enough. Like, do try to make it easier on on the guy so that they can perform at the highest level, man. These, these are people that we're gonna need. That hopefully, if, I never got to go to the playoffs, but if we got if we're in the playoffs, you want these guys to be performing because they're gonna be having to be in the game in big moments sometimes too. So, yep, that's awesome. I love that story, and that's what people need to hear. That works in all walks. Just taking care of someone that is new or needs to be shown the way. And I think some teams do that significantly better than others. And that's why some teams have rookies thriving, you know, because it's it's not just, hey, let's not pick on these guys. There's some teams that are like, hey, let's make these guys feel like they're one of us from the jump. They'll pay it forward and it'll be a thing in our org. So I love that. It's an awesome story. All right. A couple other things uh, before we get to slap. So we have opening day fits. Shall we? <laughs> Kike, Kike oh, won. Kike. I am Kenuff. Ke- Kike that's a swaggy won. fit right there. Uh, I don't know if Kike won. This, no, that's that's a D. Come on. The loafers. Baby. Come on. Man. Look, I mean. Oh, that's swag. Free the nip. <laughs> that's, that's nice. That's nice. I mean, that's, yeah, that's my heart that's right there. Philly. Yeah. But Morpheus, Morpheus wins. Red, red or blue pill? That is definitely a blue, a blue pill. <laughs> Who was Morpheus? I missed it. What player? Oh, Pablo. Pablo Lopez. Pablo Lopez. Oh. Shohei. Shohei couldn't be more Shohei. Rocking his yeah. New Balance no. guns. Rocking his New Balance Patrick sneakers. Something. No, those are those are New Balance. Yeah. But was he wearing khakis? Shohei? He was wearing khakis. <laughs> uh, khakis. What are you wearing? <laughs> Khakis. Khakis. Are they yeah, khaki colored? No, they're actually khakis. Kike yeah. went all out, though. Like, someone made that for opening day. That was going to get a ton of pub. Do you think any of it had to do with his offseason, Kratz? Oh, now you kind of read that shirt a little different if you go back and watch the Kike interview here on FT after he signed, like two days after he signed. Hmm. I, I thought there, there was intent with that outfit, just like there was when we spoke to him. Okay, and then oh, yeah. here's the losing the losing fit for me is this next photo Stop. because they have to put some blue 42 in that freaking blue burger. The Royals have oh. a back to blue burger with blue buns for the 2024 season. Blue cheese crumbles, bacon, lettuce, buffalo aioli, all about all of that. But – when I see the blue, AJ, I'm thinking mold. It's just, it's going to be a tough look if I had to eat a burger that's blue bunned. Yeah, mold or I don't know, man. That That's not something I would eat. Next is green eggs and ham or something like that, too. Dr. Seuss is yeah. in charge of their menu over there. You ain't uh, eating that, yeah. AJ? Come on, man. You Hell don't play no. anymore. You're not eating that? Why? Because it's blue? I- I eat more healthy now than I did when I was playing. Probably like I, I'm just like trying to get younger now. So like I, I'm all about the health. I'm not putting what you, whatever. Let's say blue thirty two in there or whatever. It's got to be. Band, That's got to be. I'm big. In that burger. Yeah, I'm I'm big on that, Kratz. So I try as best as possible to look at labels, and this isn't even an allergy thing. I just I know enough about the yellow five and the red ten and what. It's not needed. It's it's freaking dye. It's food dye, and it's a chemical. So it's very simple. Like we need to get rid of that. You know, I'm going to be on my food stand for one second, my nutrition stand, but it's not even a flavor thing. So, and I'm, I'm also not going to um, implement slander because I don't know if that's what is used. So I'd have to get the ingredients. Although most of the time, those types of ballpark foods never give you the ingredients if they're run by you know, big food. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that there's something in there that I do not want and I I'm, hate it. I'm, I'm trying to look at my schedule here. We have the celebration for I got I got to look when I'm going to Kansas City. So you're mm. you're not condoning me eating the blue 42 even on the weekend. Let's see what's the weekend that I'm going there. Do you I think gotta, that leaves your mouth it. blue? You know, like the like the pop out on that. Mouth blue. I I hate that. I hate anything that changes the color of your of your mouth. I hate looking at that. So, I hate. Like, I don't like it when other people have that and they like smile and saying. like their teeth are all blue. Like, it's like. Or their tongue. Uh, yeah, get away. <laughs> get, get away. You're, you're gross. Although I, yeah. all the ingredients inside of it, I mean, can I ask for a non-blue bun and, and make Scotty not like 
I'll ask for the gluten-free blue bun. How about that? Uh, yeah, that would be great. But even if it's not, I just don't want the fake stuff in it. And maybe I'm wrong. Again, I'm going to put the disclaimer out there. Maybe you're gonna, they're going to come out and say, we used you know, some vegetable that colored it. Because that's what they are doing when they're trying blueberries. to, you know, Blue, yeah, blueberries sure. Blueberries in the mix, I'm sure. <laughs> There's no way that one of those big food companies that put this together put blueberries in there. They definitely put that cheap, cheap in there. You know it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get that mm -hmm. picture. I'm gonna smack two of them Johns for you. Okay. Ooh. When you're there, can you when you're there, can you do me a favor? Go up there and say, Hi, I have some allergies. I just want to see the ingredient <laughs> list on the yeah. buns and yes. take a photo for us. This is what the people will look like when they when I ask that question, they'll be like, What? <laughs> <laughs> we don't do ingredient so lists. They're so so like, Do you want to be a smurf or <laughs> not? Leave. Okay. That's yeah. it. <laughs> We want this. We do you want this or not? Like you can go yeah. and get a peanut butter jelly pie too down the road. <laughs> you might turn blue when you eat it. Okay, let's slap. Dominant closer out of the bullpen today. That was save 100 because you're on 99, right? They no one could give you that that hundo. Man, I was I was in line for it. Whenever we were, I was with the Angels. We were playing in Texas. I even got ready within two pitches because I I was like I knew uh, Inglesias, who was a closer with the Angels at the time, was down, and I had told Madden like, "Yo, the 99 saves." He's like, "We're gonna get you that hundred save for sure," and so that was my opportunity. Uh, it was in the eighth inning. Uh, I forgot who was in. I don't, I don't even name names, but he blew it. And I was so heated because I was in Texas, too. So, like, I have a huge family. So, like, 250 people were there just for me, my, my, own, my yeah. own family. And I was like, this would have been a, a little cherry on top, but it didn't happen. So, so now I'm just stuck at 99. But it's all right, though. I kind of made peace. It's a good story, too, you know people will look at your stats and they'll go 99 and they'll want to know. So yep. you crushed it today though, man. It was awesome having you on. Um, Kratz hats, what do you got for us? A little throwback Milwaukee, John. It was cool. We played, we wore these, we wore these in 18 when I was there. We had another throwback, but it was like the white with the striped. These are cool. These are cool. That's so the Mario M. Yeah, that's the, also, to not to be confused with the W team for a, for a win. That's right. Well, that's the same font that the Twins and the Marlins use for that certain variation, right? No, yeah, yep. That they were all they they were both arguing. Oh, you're gripping my style. No, they we had it first. No, we <laughs> had it. And the Mariners are up there. We just do it fifty four percent of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, ha happy birthday, Matt Olson, Chad Pinder, Brian Jordan, and Pirates <laughs> owner Bob Nutting. <laughs> He's going to be like, mm, anyone got free dinner for me? I bet that's a big party. And I'm going to say this on Bob Nutting's birthday, and I'm glad you brought it up. I thought you were going to skip Bob Nutting's birthday. No way. I, I don't always do birthday shout outs, but I got to give it to Bobby. Bob Nutting, for as much as he is cheap with free agents and does not ever spend, when I played for the Pirates, he paid for my entire family to go to his Four Seasons Resort called Seven Springs outside of Pittsburgh, and it was free stay, free food, free drinks, free childcare, free activities. We had the run of the whole place, and he did. He offered that to every player and their family. So, happy birthday, Bob! You're a nice man. I need you to go out in free agency and push this team into the playoffs because Pittsburgh needs it. I didn't know that. You, you've never shared that part for us. I never have. We never. It's always been a lot of Bob Nutting bashing. You know, only yes. only one free agent ever in his tenure. Wow, um, I get, it, you humanized him a little bit just now. It was good. That was nice. On his birthday. On his birthday. Yes. There's super, always tomorrow. Super chat. Yes, no, it's a good one. Super chat shout out to Northside Geo. He said, Kratz needs a spinoff show. He said, you're electric. And actually that super chat's in blue. So Kratz is going to be blue in a couple months when he's in KC. But again, AJ, awesome having you on, man. This was fun. We'll have to do it again and, and hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, anytime you guys want me on, I'll be here. 
Love it. You'll definitely get the invite, man. This was great. And we're hitting the show on the dot at three o'clock on a Friday. So enjoy the weekend of games, everyone. FT coming in strong again on Monday. See you then. Good job, rookie. Now give me some coffee. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.